Today, we explore the story of the Holland Tunnel. When it opened for traffic on November the 13th, 1927, New York's Holland Tunnel was not only the world's very first mechanically ventilated underwater vehicle tunnel, but it was also the largest of its type. This masterpiece of a roadway was named after Clifford M. Holland, the visionary who designed it, with a north tube of 8,558 feet and a south tube of 8,371 feet long, it reaches a depth of 93.4 feet below the water level with a road surface that's 20 feet wide. The Holland Tunnel is notable in length, but it was also considered an incredible achievement of engineering. During the early stages of the tunnel's planning, 11 different concepts were proposed. The first of these plans was a bi-level tunnel 31 feet in diameter by the Jacob and Davies firm. Even the chief engineer of the Panama Canal, George W. Gothels, drew up a design proposal. His design suggested a single concrete lined tube with two levels that had three traffic lanes running through it. On the other hand, Holland's plans indicated that rather than using a single tube, two twin tubes could be implemented instead. These tubes would be lined with cast iron and have only a single deck with two lanes of traffic. Holland's plan would win out in the end, and as things were being finalized and discussed, many other engineers were hard at work trying to come up with an effective ventilation system. The design of the ventilation system required an incredible amount of work and research on behalf of multiple different institutions. These institutions included the Bureau of Mines in Pittsburgh, which determined the composition of motor gas, and the University of Illinois to determine the amount of power needed to operate the ventilation system, and even Yale University, which studied the effects of carbon monoxide on humans. Around that same time, Holland would travel overseas to Europe to research ventilation systems of English, German, and Scottish tunnels. The ASCE Metropolitan Section reports that at the time of these studies, it was concluded that to operate safely, the tunnel would need to have a pressurized airflow rate of 27 cubic meters per second throughout the tunnel. To put this into perspective, the acceptable standard of carbon monoxide content was four parts per 10,000 parts of air. On opening day, the average count in the tunnel was just 0.69 parts per 10,000 parts of air, with its highest being just 1.60. This led many New Yorkers to proclaim that the air quality in the tunnel was better than the air quality in the city itself. This new ventilation system would challenge the conventions of previous ventilation systems in railroad tunnels. These old ventilation systems would blow air from one portal to another. However, this was not feasible for a vehicle tunnel as it needed gale force winds exceeding 70 miles per hour always blowing through the tunnel to clear the exhaust from vehicles, which could be a massive fire hazard, especially in such an enclosed environment. To work, the Holland Tunnel needed a completely new system, a system in which clean air would be readily supplied through an air duct below the roadway. There were openings to this air duct in intervals, and an exhaust duct ran above the airway to remove the fumes from the tunnel. This also reduced the fire risk, as the spread of flames would be confined thanks to the air being drawn straight up. Two ventilation buildings were placed on either side of the Hudson, housing 84 fans in total. One half of the fans are used to pump clean air into the tunnel, and the other half are used as exhaust fans. Only 56 of the fans are operational at a time, with the remaining fans being reserved for emergencies. Each fan is 80 feet in diameter. However, before they were ready to start building, they had to be sure that this would work. To evaluate how effective the new ventilation system would be, the Bureau of Mines constructed a 400-foot-long scale model. Once it was complete, the final touches were put on the design, and the time had finally come to start the incredible project. When construction of the tunnel officially began on March the 31st, 1922, with a groundbreaking ceremony, the Holland Tunnel was known as the Hudson River Vehicular Tunnel. Construction was a massive project with the use of caissons and pneumatic shields, the latter of which were pneumatically pushed through the river bottom to dig through mud and serve as the shell for the actual tunnel. 
Compressed air inside the caissons was pumped to pressurize the interior to keep dirt and water outside, making it possible for workers called sand hogs to excavate parts of the tunnel and place cast iron rings as wall support. Workers spent large amounts of time underwater in caissons with pressure up to 47.5 pounds per square inch. Well, there were 528 cases of a sickness called the Benz, also referred to in our video on the Brooklyn Bridge, caused by the release of nitrogen bubbles in the blood by a rapid decompression. Miraculously, no men died due to the illness itself. However, the tunnel's construction was not without tragedy. 13 workers had died between 1921 and 1924. As time went on, the job became safer with improved techniques, but two more disasters would occur before the Holland Tunnel finally opened. The first of these deaths was none other than the chief engineer himself, Clifford Holland. Five years into work on the tunnel, the immense amounts of stress from his job led to a nervous breakdown. It is widely speculated that the long hours spent in the pressurized air of the tubes may have affected his mental health. Holland remained in a Michigan sanitarium for the rest of his life, but he died of heart disease on October the 27th, 1924. He was just 41 years old, and his death came two days before the New York and New Jersey ends of the tube were meant to meet. Out of respect for him, the tunnel was renamed in his honor, and even today, it remains one of few major works of engineering that was named after its engineer. In the wake of Holland's death, Milton Freeman was assigned to be the chief engineer of the tunnel, but again, tragedy would strike, as mere months later, Freeman would die from acute pneumonia on March the 24th, 1925. His successor was Oli Singstan, who would oversee the construction until its completion. Though Singstan's success didn't just stop with the Holland Tunnel, he went on to design all of New York City's underwater vehicle tunnels, the Lincoln Tunnel, the Queens Midtown Tunnel, and the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel. Singstan also worked on the Baltimore Harbor Tunnel and served as the president of the ACE Met Section in 1934 and 1935. Finally, after years of grueling construction, the Holland Tunnel formally opened on November the 12th, 1927. President Calvin Coolidge used a golden telegraph key from his yacht in the Potomac River to part the giant American flags over the entrance to the tunnel, opening the way for 20,000 people to walk through the tunnel and admire it in all of its glory. The tunnel remained open to the public to tour on foot for two hours, and at midnight, it was open to vehicles with 51,694 cars passing through it on opening day. The first car to enter the Holland Tunnel from Manhattan carried the chairman of New York State's Bridge and Tunnel Commission, along with the widows of Clifford Holland and Milton Freeman. The New York Entrance Plaza remains a monument to the memory of Freeman. It was named Freeman Square in his honor. It cost $48.5 million to build in total, with expenses that New York and New Jersey shared. The Holland Tunnel was a massive success, helping lighten the load for both water traffic and city traffic, especially when it came to the overtaxed ferry system. The ASCE Metropolitan Section took 18 minutes to travel, with motorists waiting for hours at a time. It also broke through the barrier between New York and New Jersey trade, paving the way for an efficiency once thought to be impossible. In 1930, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey took control of the tunnel, but not the property title. And although this tunnel still thrives today, it was not without incident throughout its history. On May the 13th, 1949, a chemical truck loaded with 80 drums of carbon disulfide that were both poisonous and extremely flammable exploded inside the tunnel. The power of the fans made things worse by fanning the flames. In the end, it cost $600,000 in damage, destroyed 23 trucks, and injured over 60 people. Though thankfully, nobody was killed. This situation was a catalyst for a worldwide crackdown on chemical and explosive transportation standards to avoid similar incidents. However, this was not the last time the Holland Tunnel would be threatened by fire. In 2002, a fire erupted in an abandoned warehouse near the western entrance
the Manhattan-bound lanes were closed off for several hours to deal with the fire, causing massive backups and delays for motorists. 